Welcome back, warriors. Tanse Sego Ani Buju. Kwe Ninda Luizi Pam Palmeter. And I am the host of this show, The Warrior Life. This is a show about living the warrior life, a lifestyle that focuses on decolonizing our minds, bodies, and spirits, while at the same time revitalizing our cultures, traditions, laws, and governing practices. But it's also about asserting and living our sovereignty all over Turtle Island. And whether we call it nationhood, peoplehood, sovereignty, or self-determination, we are really talking about governing ourselves and our territories according to our own laws for the benefit of all living things, humans, plants, animals, and otherwise. Because it's our responsibility to protect all living things. But that's not an easy task. We as Native peoples have faced centuries of genocidal violence and dispossession that has never been addressed. The National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls confirmed what we know through our lived experiences, that genocide continues today, and that includes the exploitation of our lands and waters. Our families, clans, houses, villages, and nations have all been impacted, not only by intergenerational trauma, but multiple generations of colonized educations, healthcare, governing, and economic systems, which put undue influence on our people. This creates significant challenges for us today as sovereign nations and peoples in how we can go forward governing and protecting our traditional territories. But today we have a special show about some of the challenges faced by the Shwetmik people in relation to the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this issue, First Nations, municipalities, and environmental groups have been fighting against Trans Mountain Pipeline and its expansion in what is now known as BC. First Nations like the tsleil Squamish, Coldwater, Stolo, Upper Nicola, and Shekwetmik uh, people have always asserted Aboriginal title over this area. And they were successful in overturning Canada's approval of its own pipeline for an expansion because they didn't consult with Native people. However, Canada reapproved the pipeline and First Nations had to go back to court to challenge it. But this time, Canada's courts wouldn't even hear the appeal. And now Trans Mountain is using all of its influence, its politics, and its money to try to forge ahead based on agreements with some First Nations band councils. But not all First Nation councils have uh, consented to the pipeline, nor have the people given their free prior and informed consent. So on today's podcast, we're going deeper into these issues to talk with leaders in the Shekwetmik Nation, Nisconlet Chief Judy Wilson, Shekwetmik Elder Alice Abbey, and of course, Kanahus Manuel from Tiny House Warriors. It's it's an honor and a privilege to actually be able to sit with these three women, at least virtually, and hear about all of the things that are happening on the ground and what's upcoming and what are the core issues that are at stake. So maybe we can start by each of you introducing yourselves according to your own language and customs. Maybe Alice, you would like to start? Okay, thank you, Pam. In Jesuits, it's Quasa, Alice Abbey, Wait Kohweda. Uh, Inawaki, in Jajua is an Indian's name. I'm Alice Abbey, I'm from the Siskwakan Uluk, and I'm also an elder of the Siskwakan people. The Siskwakan people have occupied the Siskwakan Uluk since time immemorial. The Declaration of the Siskwakan Sovereignty of 1983, they quote, Siskwakan Gukbis and the representatives declare that on this day, January 17th, 1983, we reaffirm our sovereignty over our collective traditional territory. We are the Kia'as and the Khba'as of our Siskwakma Uluk, whose territory reaches from the Rocky Mountains in the east to the Fraser River in the west, ranging from Williams Lake in the north and Armstrong in the south, covering approximately 180,000 square kilometers of territory. Siskwakma people know that the, all the waters, the animals, the trees, the plants are powerful beings and that have always existed in our human world and the spirit world. Siskwakum de Kalmuch coexisted with these ancestral beings, and many of our people are related to certain animal spirits 
such as the bear, the berries, the plants and the salmon, the chiefs, we call these, of, of our people. So Squaqum wealth and health is sustained by our territory and traditional practices also sustain our Sasquatch's gene. It is through our gift giving ceremonies, our sacrifice and our feasting ceremonies that we give thanks to the ancestral spirits for their kindness and for their generosity. We share these gifts and we celebrate our collective Sasquatch Uluq. Preserving our territory for our future generations, not only for our Sasquatch people and human beings, but for generations of our plants, of our animals, of our water, and all living things, our Koseltan. Protecting Sasquatch Uluq is not an intellectual exercise. It is a sacred duty and responsibility to exercising our Sasquatch laws. No collective free and informed consent from our Sasquatch people was given for this trans mountain development, this bitumen. Dotleys and Jesuit Hemstetens, alas, the alias of the trans mountain pipeline. In my mind, I don't remember the goodness of this pipeline going through our territory. Therefore, the Shushwap elders, we reaffirm our sacred duty and responsibility to protect our Sasquatch Uluq from this trans mountain pipeline that proposes to cross over 500 kilometers of our unceded, our Sasquatch territory. He eats and Kochjams, a Kochnimendam and Jesuits of Kochlukendams, Kochjam. Thank you very much, Alice, for that. That's a really important background for people to understand that it's your collective territory and you haven't given consent. Um, Kanahus, would you like to introduce yourself and go next? Um, hello, everybody. My name is Kanahus Besky. It means Red Woman in Tanaka. I'm both from the Sequatmuk and the Tanaka Nations. I'm coming to you right now from the Sukhwatmuk Uluk and we're tiny house warriors. Our mission is to stop the pipeline by building tiny houses in the path of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. The tiny house warriors, we are Sukhwatmuk land defenders and we're upholding our Sukhwatmuk law and our duties to um, uphold our laws to defend and protect our lands by any means necessary. We are there standing on the ground. We brought our tiny houses out onto the path of a thousand man man camp for the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And we've been there since July, 2018. Um, so this is our third summer occupying and stopping this man camp. Um, thank you. Chief Judy. Wake a cry to prescribed Cookie Judy Wilson, Skachin Tay Sequatum, Sequatum Ulu. I'm very uh, honored to be on the your podcast pan and also with uh, the strong equipment women here, uh, Alice and Kenus. Uh, we do have an, an important uh, story to tell. We do have an important message for all people, not just our equipment people, not just Kalmuk or indigenous people. This message is for all uh, people that inhabit uh, Mother Earth uh, because it's going to affect them. It's affecting our lifestyles already. It's affecting our consciousness. It's affecting our spirituality. It's affecting our food sovereignty. It's affecting our way of life. COVID should have been an important uh, message already that Mother Earth is sending to us that we have to change the way we're inhabiting the Earth. We have to change the way we're living. We have to change the way we do things every day and our reliance on dirty fossil fuel oil. Uh, for the first time, China was able to see, uh, you know, the, the smog and the, the pollution uh, clearly gave them some clear clear air, some clear uh, uh, water in Italy, you know, all of these changes around the world because we had to stop our lifestyle and we had to stop driving, we had to stop flying. And I think there was a message in that COVID. And also the same messages we're getting in climate change and global warming. Uh, we can't sustain this uh, ill-fated, the destiny we're on with oil, the dirty oil and gas, the bitumen, and it was the worst ever economic uh, investment any country could have did investing in the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Uh, you know, there's foreign multi-corporations that are behind this and we're, uh, they're pushing this pipeline through. 
uh, where our people haven't consented to it. Our people have not given any consent for this Trans Mountain Pipeline. And uh, also there's a declaration that was made uh, several years ago. I went and attended. I'm, I'm here today representing uh, as a chief of my community, uh, but I also respect that I'm an elected Indian Act chief. So I always create the space and recognize the voice of our proper title holders and our elders and our women, especially uh, in these critical discussions uh, in our hereditary chiefs and you know, the people that, uh, you know, our traditional government system was uh, established under because the government set up these different divisionary tactics, which are continuing to do with Trans Mountain. And also, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of our band councils are buying into those uh, uh, anthropological uh, divisions Tate set up, uh, whereas in even some of the books that were written, uh, Dr. Cookie, Ron Ignis, his book uh, says, you know, how, how did that division really work? And, you know, it was a colonial notion, a colonial uh, name given to divisions. The word divisions alone set apart uh, these communities. And we were one collective community. We had our own governing system. Alice kind of set the tone and the context, what that means to, to us as uh, Sakwapan people. And I think it's, it's a, a very uh, contradictory way of, of making decisions. Is if we need to come together as Sakwapan people, and that's what we're calling for, the Sakwapan people coming together uh, to do this. Also, um, I think the uh, government of BC is pushing their, their type of agreements to our, pe our, our leadership. Uh, but it hasn't been consented to our uh, by our people and you can't have seasonal round gatherings and say well the people gave their consent to engage the provincial government on thailand rights and governance issues when clearly there's a proper process under our supreme protocols and laws to do that we can't just uh, you know start engaging you know the province that way especially saying that the province has um they have their jurisdiction and laws over our territorial lands, which were unceded, unrelinquished, not surrendered ever in any way, shape, or form, were outside of the BC treaty process, and will never go to that process. Our people themselves will never go to this process, but there's uh, divisions and factions and councils that are pushing those processes because they think that's the only answer. We have to be able to say no. Uh, our answers are in our sovereignty. Our answers are in our self-determination. Our answers are in our free, prior, informed consent of our people. Our people must decide because our Indian Act chief and councils will come and go, but our people will be on the land, as Alice mentioned and Kenny's mentioned, our people will be on the land forever. And we, our ancestors stood up to all these colonial forces, if you will, these colonial tactics to relinquish, make us relinquish our land and our resources, but they never fell for them. Our ancestors stood strong and tall, and we need to do that again. Many of our Sequepan women are doing that, and I support them for that because they're courageous and they're not being uh, uh, disillusioned by any any of the, what Trans Mountain is doing, uh, throwing all their money around and you know coming in and, and making it sound good that we're going to follow this corporate agenda. We have to get away from that, and we have to say we have our own agenda as Sequepan people. And that was to live in balance and harmony with Mother Earth and what uh, was created for us. And we can do that. Our ancestors showed that we did that. We can do that again. And the economy, if it collapses, which has happened around the world, especially with the COVID economic fallout, and especially with uh, the changes that are happening now, uh, we see with global warming and uh, uh, all the changes that are happening, it's, it's forcing us to make some really deep changes to everything we do. And I'm hoping the listeners of this podcast will reach into their heart, reach into their mind, and reach into their soul to say, we have to be able to support our land defenders. We have to support our water protectors because the Mother Earth is the only thing we're going to have at the end of the day. All that cash will mean be meaningless. All of those other things will be nothing. Because as Alice pointed out, our food sovereignty and our Mother Earth are a key importance to our survival as a people. Sorry, I rant, got on, Lou. Thank you. No, I mean, th that's so important that people understand that this is, this isn't just about our lands as native peoples and governing our territories, but if there is no clean water or farmable land or land that the animals and plants can live on, nobody survives this, you know, pending climate disaster. And I'm wondering, Alice, um, just before this 
podcast started, you were talking about some of those things that people don't take into consideration, you know, that the impact of changes in the environment to plants, animals, birds. Could you talk a little bit about that? Okay, last summer, uh, um, traveling through our territories, the Swakam Uloch, on the highway of 97. Um, prior to that, there was a rock slide in what is known as uh, the Boston Bar area the, along the Fraser River. And it really, really impacted our salmon supply. And not only our salmon supply, but all of our Kosaltans, all of the Kangeknam, all of the Spuiui, all of the bears and all of our eagles. And as I was traveling down this road and I looked up and I was watching and I was seeing all of our Spuiui, there was probably at least a hundred sitting on the treetops along our Saswapa Ulo, and they were waiting for their food supply. Mm-hmm. And it nickened them and Jeju as a boopsman. It really cut my heart to see that. And our people have short memories. And that is just only a minor impact of a one landslide. Can you imagine? Can you even imagine that? You don't even want to think about this. That if that water line, if that bitumen line that they're trying to put into our Saswapa Ulo even broke, underneath our water, our rivers, the, the catastrophe, it would be catastrophe for our food supply, for our people, for our territory, and not only us, like I keep saying, and I keep really wanting to just let people know that we're not only talking about ourselves as human beings, we're giving voice to all of our relatives, mm-hmm. and that is our sacred responsibility that we have, and our duty to do that. That's so important because the question is never, I wonder if this pipeline will leak, all pipelines leak, and it's how often it leaks and how much contamination there is. But it's not just contamination that pipelines bring into our territories. And Kanahus, you've been very outspoken on some of the other issues, like the impact on our women of having these man camps located on our territories. Could you talk a little bit about why you have concerns about Trans Mountain? Well, right now, where we're located and where we live is in Blue River. It's um, along Highway 5. Um, Highway 5 is connected to the Highway 16, which is the Highway of Tears. So just a couple of hours north from where we are is the Highway of Tears on Highway 16. And for people that don't know about Highway 16 and the Highway of Tears, there's been thousands of Native women that have went missing and murdered on that highway. And so it shows the, the type of system, the type of society that we live in, where we could have thousands of Indigenous women go missing and, and we're never able to find them, find the murderers or find their bodies and if they're even alive. And so this is exactly what we're facing with the Trans Mountain Man Camp. These industrial man camps linked to oil and gas industry have been creating havoc on our communities and our Indigenous women. Um, There's been multiple reports, international human rights reports, um, some of them by Amnesty International Mm -hmm. regarding these industrial man camps that they linked and there's a direct correlation with the increase of violence against Indigenous women in and around these resource extraction man camps. Um, These attacks include sexual attacks, include rape and and forced um, human trafficking. And so many Indigenous women are now coming forward across Canada about the human trafficking. And these man camps are linked to this, um, like I call this a global pandemic, Mm -hmm. is the the human trafficking of Indigenous peoples and women. And this man camp in particular wants to house a thousand men. And in recent newspaper articles, it's saying a 500-man man camp. Actually, a 1,000-man man camp is what they applied for a permit for. Um, and it's not just the, the sexual violence that comes around these man camps. There's also many other forms of violence, including mm-hmm. drug violence and alcohol violence, um, the violence that comes with um, addicts that are working and receiving large amounts of money. These are majority transient men that are coming to these camps. They have no link with community. They have no accountability to the communities. They leave their wives and their families in other parts of the country or even in other countries and come here to these rural isolated areas. In the Clearwater Man Camp, which is around an hour and a half hours 
an hour and a half hours north from from Blue River or or south actually. It's actually Clearwater is located in between Kamloops and Blue River. They have also applied for a man camp. This man camp is now fenced, and they're bringing in trailers. The trailers for the man camp are parked right there, and their foundation is all set. Um, they're now applying for a permit to allow a bar uh, to serve alcohol in this man camp, which I believe is just uh, asking for more violence happening in and around the area. Um, we don't want this man camp to have this alcohol permit to serve alcohol and we, we want it stopped. We want all the permits revoked. And in fact, the United Nations and through the Sukhot Muglan defenders putting pressure and, and educating and filing formal submissions to CERD in the United Nations, the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Um, the UN CERD had blasted Canada, telling them to stop the construction of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, to revoke all of the permits for the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And so we are, you know, acting and, you know, demanding that Canada act on this called by the United Nations and to revoke all the permits for the Trans Mountain, including the man camp permits. And these man camp permits are being issued by the BC Oil and Gas Commission. Um, the BC Oil and Gas Commission, I believe, was formed in the 80s and through some researchers saying that Richard Kinder himself was involved in forming this BC Oil and Gas Commission. Um, they're the ones that fall under the Ministry of um, oil, petroleum, and, and mining. I forget the whole ministry's name, but it falls within the, under there. And, you know, I witnessed firsthand the Mount Polly mine disaster. I actually sunk right into the tailings by actually breaching through security because they had so much security and so much locked security gates uh, around one of the worst mine tailings disasters that ever happened in BC. And I saw firsthand how the government covered up any type of disaster or mine spill like this, and how they were so fast to open the doors back up to Mount Polly to, to start mining again. And it just really shows that the mandate for these ministries are to develop mines, are to develop pipelines, but then they're also involved in the permitting process. So it's a complete conflict of interest um, for them to be approving permits when they're, when they're supposed to be really looking at these projects and really looking at, are they going to um, violate indigenous rights? Are they going to destroy the environment? And they're not because their mandate is to develop them. They don't really care about anything else. They don't care about human rights. They don't care about indigenous rights. They want to open up shop and investment to the global world. Uh, what's happening in Trans Mountain is to push through a landlocked resource to Tidewater. And they're trying to go through our land to do it. And these man camps are making their ability to house thousands of workers so they could push this pipeline through as fast as they can. And so we're putting a thorn in that, we're stopping this one man camp, but we want to amp up our direct action. And we want everybody to really voice their outrage about man camps in BC. Thank you. Well, I think it's so important because this is as much about ending genocide in Canada as it is protecting our environment. I mean, we know in both Canada and the United States that anywhere where there's man camps, for any of these extractive industries, much higher rates of alcoholism, drug use, criminality, abuse of women, and abductions, exploitation, and murders of Indigenous women and girls. I mean, that's all over. And so you don't see that in their consideration for approvals. You don't see that as a valid consideration. But, you know, Chief Judy, something else comes to mind here when I'm listening to Kanahu's talk. A thousand man man camp in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, this must also raise serious concerns for your nation about the health and safety of your people. Yeah, the, uh, the man camps, the uh, developments were deemed essential services. And we already had COVID in Curl Lake. Uh, that was uh, test positive. There was uh, issues around that. And the same with Site C, I believe. 
So, you know, it, it's, it's very clear that this COVID could happen. We're having outbreaks in Kelowna right now, for example. And in BC, it went over 3,300 uh, now that uh, had COVID and uh, a few hundred deaths. Uh, so it's almost like a, another kind of mini outbreak that, that's being dealt with in, in, within the health uh, areas. But uh, a lot of our nations are um, completely shut down still. A lot of the nations did not reopen. And I know we were supporting that position. Uh, it's concerning with our community being right on the Trans Canada Highway. Uh, the community members took it upon themselves with some of the other uh, council members to do soft checkpoints, if you will. But it's really important uh, because you have tourism and then you have these man camps where a great amount of men come together. And uh, we already know uh, personal history. I've, I've heard stories and personal accounts that were from men that attended these man camps. And, a lot of them are good, hardworking men, but they, they uh, stayed clear, but they clearly said these things were happening. These things happen in those man camps and, and women are uh, violated and, uh, you know, abused and there is drugs, there's alcohol. Uh, you know, how can that be regulated? They say, oh, we, we're going to come in with all these regulations, but, you know, they're not even be he being heated in the existing man camps. What makes them think on a new proposed man camp they're going to be heating these regulations? There's already documented reports about the abuses of our women. And I work in a lot of areas supporting missing, murdered Indigenous women uh, throughout Turtle Island. Uh, we had inaugural uh, tribunal uh, hearings in Browning, Montana, where the tribes have taken it upon themselves to do the hearings because the government has oppressed that process. And here we had a national inquiry, which equally oppressed the process uh, for, you know, I think uh, uh, Commissioner Marion Billier did, did the best she could. And she did call it genocide for what it is. And uh, I think, though, the, the government kind of stifled her report and stifled mm -hmm. the process in what that National Inquiry was supposed to have been intended for. So here we have a lot of challenges. That's why the messages are important that we hear today, uh, that you know we cannot have man camps, especially in a, a nation that's already uh, grappling with COVID and already a nation that's dealing with missing, murdered Indigenous women uh, and violence against women. We're, we're trying to address those issues, not increase and escalate those issues with man camps in our territory. Thank you. Well, and so here I see multiple overlapping issues. You've got the current threat of COVID, which isn't going away anytime soon. It's kind of up and down. And then there's going to be the second wave of COVID. You have the real lie lived experiences of women and girls who are exploited and abused by uh, people at man camps. Um, you have uh, the, and then there's the other aspect that people don't often think about. Anytime police are brought into our territories to protect uh, the extractive industry and, you know, to ensure that their operations continue, that results in the harassment of our people, the surveillance of our people, the monitoring, collecting of data of our people, often arrests of our people, sometimes violent takedowns. So all of this, the pipeline attracts all of the things that are literally violent and harmful to our people. Yet at the same time, when we want to close our borders to keep COVID out of our territories, you don't see the RCMP coming and saying, you know what, we're going to help you defend your rights against people trying to invade your territories. And, you know, one of the things that I've noticed, and I wondered, um, Alice, if, if you have other concerns about this, is that if you look at the example of the Wet'suwet'en and what's happening with coastal gas link pipeline, it's not just all of these issues that we have mentioned and they're huge, but once these approvals have happened, there is never a guarantee that these companies are going to live up to the environmental commitments that they have made. Like look at the hundreds of wetlands that have been impacted by Coastal Gas Link Pipeline and they had promised not to do that. So they've been found in non-compliance. How worried are you that in your territory, your waters, your plants, your medicines, your herbs, your sacred places will be disrupted even if they promise not to? Oh, it, uh, like I have no faith, absolutely none, that um, any of these extractive industries will be able to put together all of our relatives again. Because you, you just can't do that. Um, 
like for example, take, take like we're, we're talking with Sultan, our consultants, our relatives, mm-hmm. way up north. Um, I, I feel very sorry for them, you know, and for the elders because that coastal link, like this earliest Tuesday, like they had a, a, a earthquake in Alaska. It was seven point, what, six, seven. And, um, and all of the people, and they were so worried about a tsunami. And then, so you take a look at the Wissotan and they're fighting and, and, and they're fighting against this, um, this destruction of their territory, not so much the coastal link, but their destruction of their plants, of their animals and their relatives, their medicines, because the whole area will never be the same again. They're, they're so displaced, they're uprooted and they're moved. You know, and, and it will never, they, it will never be the same again. It doesn't matter how much money, how much money is put into anything. They could never fix the destruction that these extractive industries cause, not only to human beings, but to all of our relatives, mm-hmm. you know. And um, like I say, and, and say for, let, let's go, let's fast forward. Say that the LNG gas, gas line went through on the coast, right in the middle of the earthquake. What happens then? What happens to all of these um, these boats and these these you know like it's just not viable. No matter whichever way you want to measure and look at it, it is not viable all the way around. And we don't want to be known as bitumen BC. We want to stay beautiful BC. Well, Thank you. that's it's so it's so important that people understand all the dimensions of this that. You know, it's about more than money. Money is so temporary. Money's nothing. Money's paper. You can't eat it. You can't, you know, do ceremony with it. And and Kanahus, you know, I noticed that many of our on the ground warriors, it's our women leading the way, our women that are rising up to protect our territories, our women that are making the sacrifices by being on the ground, by being in the way by risking their freedom and their privacy and their liberties, risking being harassed by police officers, but you do it anyway. How important is it to our nations that they see our women out there on the ground defending our territories? It's really important for our people to support every land defender that's out there on the ground, to publicly Mm -hmm. support them through their social media feeds, to their family, to 10 family members or 10 friends, and just say they support the Sufatmuk land defenders, they support tiny house warriors, the women, the women warriors on the ground and doing what they're doing. Because by publicly supporting us through your social media, you're eliminating and erasing the hate that's on the social media and it will erase that because what people are seeing right now when you allow racists to spew hate against us is you're encouraging more hate and we want to eliminate that so by all of the supporters across Canada to really say that they support us and publicly use their social media even if they don't even post anything else post that one thing it helps um, You know, there's like so much issues that have arisen from fighting this pipeline. Like you said, it's not just the environmental issue Mm -hmm. or it's not just the Indigenous title and rights issue or even the murdered and missing Indigenous women with the man camps. There's a lot of other issues that are coming and arising. And these are issues that have always been at play. And some of them are around jurisdiction, you know, access to territory. Like even for us through Tiny House Warriors, even looking for a place to put our tiny houses along the path of the pipeline where it will be a strategic fight against the government of Canada, you know, addressing the unceded, unsettled land issue in here and so-called BC. So the place that we established ourselves at Blue River that we're occupying right now has led to criminalization of us. Um, Although we are asserting our Sofatmuk rights and title, we're asserting rights that are even enshrined in the Canadian Constitution, that Aboriginal title and rights exist. But when we assert our rights, um, we are criminalized and we are targets um, of the state. And not just um, the RCMP, um, but the various ministries, 
you know, all the way up to the premier. We heard the premier make a statement yesterday regarding tiny house lawyers. Um, so this is affecting and this is shaking uh, and rattling this, this country up, the tiny house lawyers who's just, you think a little house and you see our image and a little tiny lawyer pumping his fist that little image of who we are going back to the land and building homes on our land are really shaking things up. And we knew it would, we knew it would. And that's why that was one of our, our, our campaign successes um, as a group of indigenous Sikwatmuk women, land defenders. And so it wasn't just women, but uh, warriors and land defenders, a whole group of us that came together to say, how are we going to fight this pipeline? And we came together with strategists and we brought native organizers from, from around our movements to come and assist us. And we built this tiny house warriors into what it is. Um, it just didn't come um, through one idea. It was a group of people, uh, organizers that had decades of resistance under their belt, you know, decades fighting Sun Peaks, fighting Gustafson Lake, fighting, mm -hmm. you know, um, <clears throat> we had a lot of that Mount Polly mine disaster to really look on how we're going to do it. And my father always said, he can go international, but we have to be on the ground grassroots and occupying and living on our land because he can talk about it, but we have to be asserting it on the ground. And after Dalgamuk decision, you know, after the Haida decision, after the Chilcotin decision, after every land title decision, our elders are yelling at us pretty well, get onto the territory, leave the reserve and go back out onto the territory. And they're telling us because we have all these decisions behind us things that our elders have been telling us all along. We have title and rights to our land. We can exclusively use and occupy our territory off reserve. And that's the big thing, off reserve. So who has jurisdiction and decision-making power on our indigenous territories off reserve is the big question. And of course, the government of Canada, when they're seeking the free prior informed consent from indigenous people, who do they go to? they're going to go to their civil servants that they invented themselves. This band office system of the people in the band office, you know, Indian Act, band office that get that federal dollars from the government. You know, my father would always say he was chief at the time. He was standing and he was in Chief Judy Wilson's position right now. He was chief in the Scala for I don't know how much terms, but a lot of terms. And he was organizing grassroots people. He was bringing well thought out PowerPoint presentations. Some of our people never even saw a PowerPoint presentation in their lifetime. He's going to our community hall. He's showing PowerPoint presentations that he made specifically for our grassroots people to understand the power we have. As Sihuatmo grassroots indigenous people, we have a power greater than band office system, he said. Babe, bigger than Indian Act. Your power is so big because it comes from Kalkukpi, from Creator. We're placed here on this land and we're gifted with this responsibility, but with this gift, we're able to enjoy the abundance of our, our world, enjoy the language that flows from our land, our culture, our foods, our relatives, our everything that flows from that land. So when we stand in defense, when we stand up against the RCMP, when we stand up against the premier, when we stand up against the contractors and Trans Mountain Pipeline, we have power. And I think that's why they see that. It's like, why are these women standing up so strong? What are, where are they getting this power from? It's all that power from our land, from our teachings, from our creator, from our elders, from our ancestors, mm -hmm. and, and the water and the eagle and the bear and, and everything from our land and this eagle feather that I'm holding right now. Um, <clears throat> this is the power that we stand with as the, as the women and people are saying, oh, it's the women, it's the women. But as women, we raise our sons. Yes. We raise our sons and we raise our sons to be respectful. We raise our sons to fight for our land, to stand beside the women, not even stand in front of them or not stand behind them, but stand beside them. And that's something that we are trying to reclaim in Tiny House Warriors and reclaiming our identity and our culture as Sopatmo is to stand with our men side by side mm -hmm. and not looking as if it's the matriarchs and the herd. No, we are one. We are the same. 
um, we come and we're born from the same women and in our nation and we're being faced with a lot of aggression and violence against us. I had my wrist broken, I had a hate attack, I had our camp truck stolen out of my possession and rammed into a house that I was in. I had the RCMP try to blame me for this hate attack, try to treat me like a suspect instead of a victim of a hate attack. We've had countless, numerous, numerous times that white males have come to our safety barricades that we've established for ourselves. And so we're being threatened because of our stand and we need people to know and, and we need everybody to stand with us at this time. Yeah, and I'm so glad you mentioned um, the power that we collectively hold as people. I mean, if you think about all of the land defenders, you know, all over Turtle Island, it's like small numbers at a time and we're very powerful. Imagine just increasing those numbers. I mean, where were we prior to the COVID pandemic? We were literally in Wet'suwet'en strong, we shut down Canada, and that was just a minute fraction of people. And it was all peaceful, but it was all determined. It was all about deserting, you know, asserting, defending, um, protecting our rights and territory. But one of the things is, the very ironic thing, and Chief Judy, I wonder if you can talk about this a little bit, is under Canadian law, so, you know, outside of Indigenous laws, where, which are paramount over anything in our territory, but under Canadian law, Aboriginal title is only recognized if you occupy your land and you exclude other people from it. I mean, these are the legal criteria that the Supreme Court of Canada uses. So we have absolutely no choice but to occupy our territories and exclude, you know, harmful elements from our territories as part of our Aboriginal title. But, you know, at the heart of all of this, and it doesn't matter what the issues are, is our right to say no. Our right to decide yes or no to things that happen in our territory. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that. Within the Shuapmuk Nation, who has the right to decide what happens with the whole nation's territory? Well, certainly, I think the uh, uh, Delmo set it out, and then Haida Spectrum for what what is uh, the consultation and what is uh, you know the proprietary uh, title and rights of uh, Indigenous people, the recognition of uh, our title and rights. Uh, then you uh, move forward to Chilcotin. Chilcotin uh, said there were underlying radical title held by the Crown, which I think is error because in many of us outside of the treaty process. The underlying title is held by our people uh, collectively. And uh, I think the court cases uh, recognize Shalpotin through the national government as the proper title holders, which is people. And in Sequepum, it's our t uh, people are the proper title holders. I know I'm using like common law type, mm -hmm. like Aboriginal titles, common law. Uh, when we uh, look at Sequep meaning uh, of uh, title, it's not held in colonial notions. Uh, in our title, it's a responsibility and a caretaking. It's indefinite. It's mm -hmm. indefinite. We, the elders will say to you, how can you sell your title? How can you give up your title? If you do that, are you even Kalmuk anymore? We cannot do that. We have a sacred, inherent responsibility from our creator for our lands and our waters. He, he by his law, by the creator's law, gave us the land, uh, gave us the known area where our land is, and this is what we're responsible for, not just for our people today, but for the future generations of people yet to come. And we had to live in balance and harmony with those. Those are our indigenous laws. Those are our teachings. And they predate any, any colonial law in the court or any provincial government legislation. Even in their infancy, they could not even come up with that. Uh, when they were forming their governments back in the in the day, uh, so it, I think it's really important to recognize the legal pluralism that we're talking about when we talk about that. We have never given up our laws. We have never given up our title and rights. We never have gave up our inherent stakes of responsibilities. So that's when Canada's and and Alice are talking about, that's what they're talking about, our inherent responsibilities. We will never relinquish them. Our grassroots, our, if you want to call them, or our people hold that. And so there is no uh, uh, colonial territorial say. The provincial government laws do not apply. 
the federal government's laws do not apply to us. And it's our people who are the territorial uh, proper title holders, if you will. And they're the ones that are going to come back together and they're going to have to make these decisions, these important decisions for the survival of our people, our land and our nations. So when the governments are doing this, when Trudeau is buying the pipeline and pushing it through our territory, he is doing it illegally. I went down to Houston to the uh, shareholders meeting down there. I was able to get a proxy uh, holder from, uh, I think the Norwegian pension fund and the New York pension fund. There's a, and I think there was a Pennsylvanian pension fund. I didn't realize those were worth trillions of dollars. And they gave up their space uh, for us to be able to speak at the shareholders uh, meeting. And I remember Kin uh, Rich Kinder was there. Uh, he was very upset that we had three proposals that went forward. The shareholders voted on two of them, but they didn't accept the climate change one, which we thought was a, a pretty a basic one, but for whatever reasons that happened. But they, they did uh, vote on those and support us on those. So, it, it's, and then right, but before I even got back, seemed like back to BC, uh, the uh, Trudeau bought the pipeline from uh, Kinder Morgan. So you can see how that happens. And, and even the BC pension was funding uh, Trans Mount or Kinder Morgan at that time. So I questioned even the BC pension fund. Do you know what you're, you're actually uh, sponsoring here or funding? And then uh, BC at that time was clearly opposed uh, to uh, Kinder Morgan. Uh, and then uh, I don't know what talks happened. I want to be clear, is, is BC still opposed to this pipeline? Mm -hmm. Because it seems like lately we've been getting, get, get, Oregon's been giving us mixed messages on this. So he needs to be clear. He needs to be clear to his, the, the ministries and to those regulation processes that Canada's is talking about. Because to me, the BC oil and gas and you know, all of the other regulatories uh, you know, seem to be uh, aligning themselves to this Trans Mountain with all the referrals we get inundated with. But the jurisdiction clearly is the Sequoia people collectively as proper title holders. They have not given their, their consent. Uh, they have a Sequoia declaration opposing that. And also the elders themselves have a resolution opposing Kinder Morgan. So our, our two, you know, the areas have been very clear. And as a uh, elected Indian Act chief, I cannot overstep that Sequoia declaration. I cannot overstep the Sequoia elders resolution opposing Kinder Morgan, which is now uh, Trans Mountain. Those were made, those decisions. I, I sat in some of those meetings and they all had valid reasons why they would not accept uh, Kinder Morgan and that which is now Trans Mountain. Very valid reasons and I support those reasons and I think uh, uh, globally uh, they're in line with all the decisions uh, against oil, dirty oil, gas and uh, oil. And I think there's reasons for it and I think it is based on you know what direction we need to change in, in how we're living our lives today. So I just want to say that uh, very clearly, the courts have been clear about, you know, the, the title and rights and the jurisdiction. And I think that they're just trying to be circumvented by Trans Mountain and these multinational corporations. Thank you. Well, I think you're raising a, a really important point here around consent. So in the media, you see you know, they're questioning, oh, well, there's consent, there's no consent, who consent and, and who doesn't. But just on this panel, we have Kanahoos Manual, who's representing a collective of tiny house warriors on the land saying you don't have consent. We have an elder who is part of other elders who have said you do not have consent. We have you, Chief Judy, and the Declaration of the People, who are in fact the title holders saying no consent. So as much as people might want to manufacture that there's some confusion around that, I think all of you sitting here today have made it very clear that there is no confusion, there is no consent, and we know that things have changed in BC. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples uh, is international recognition, not a granting, but a recognition of our ownership over our lands, our ownership over our resources, our right to self-determination, our right to say no to things happening on our territory. And BC passed a law that implements UNDRIP into BC law. So it, it amazes me that they even think that they can move forward. But um, I think this is going to provide a lot of clarity to listeners and viewers when this is posted on YouTube. And the question I always get, you know, before we end is a huge one. 
what can people do to support the Shoquemic Nation in defending their lands from Trans Mountain Pipeline? And maybe each of you can, you know, offer some ideas. Alice? Yes, um, first and foremost, I, I think um, Paul Kashin, I think to pray for us and to pray for all of our relatives. And not only the ones on the front lines, but the ones that are are making these decisions and, and that are not doing things in a good way because they, they need help too. And um, everything that we do myself here is out of respect. I do that out of respect. And uh, as my sacred duty and responsibility as a Kia and as a Suspatan. And I, one of the things that I wanted to talk about that we didn't talk about was the, uh, was the, uh, the reciprocal relationship we have. The, uh, you know how we give something and we take something. We give mm -hmm. something, we take something. It's an exchange. And, and for us as uh, Indigenous and Sohuapun people, that is so very important. That is how we sustain our territories. We do not neglect. Whatever we take, we give. Mm -hmm. And whatever they give, we, we give back. You know, like we, we it, it's just reciprocal relationship mm -hmm. we have. And that's a really important, important thing to remember because it, you're going to reap what it is that you sow. You know? And as for helping our people, um, in the future, um, very soon, we're putting together um, our people, the ability for our people to come together, all of our Siswakan people to come together. And first and foremost, we want to bring all of our Kias and Afba'as together. We want to um, talk about and see about what is going on in our territory and, and make it very clear and, and very to solidify our, all of our people in our territory. And the only way I think that we can do that is by bringing together our people, because our people collectively make decisions and collectively they will give the direction. Mm. And that is what we will be doing in the future. And we will be putting out there of how different nations and different people can align and help us. Okay? Thank, Thank you. you. We'll make sure to look for how we can support <laughs> that gathering of your people. Um, Kanahus, do you have any um, suggestions for how people can support? Um, yes, please check out our website, tinyhousewarriors.com. There's a donate button right at the top. Um, we're continuing to fund our frontline camp and we're going to be increasing and establishing more camps um, this summer as well. We have a bunch of legal cases that we are facing. We have four trials that are coming up this year on Sifat, or against Sifat Maglan defenders, all pertaining to the Trans Mountain Pipeline, including three charges that, and th for, for three land defenders that are stemming from the third round of failed consultation with the retired justice Frank Iacobucci, um, who was hired by Trans Mountain to push through um, consultation. The third phase, because all the other phases failed, um, the third phase also failed, um, and they sparked the whole round with three arrests of Savat Mughlan defenders saying no. So obviously we can't say no to this project or we'll face arrest, and that's what it's, it's proving. Um, we also really need people to keep their eyes on the front line because mm -hmm. this is what keeps us safe on the front lines from violent attacks. Continue to share all the social media that's coming out from the front lines. Um, we recently, and every day we're having attacks by white males that are coming um, to our camp. Sometimes they're escorted by the RCMP. Um, there's two other units, a part of the RCMP. There's, um, for the, anyone watching this around the world, I'm talking about the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and they have two divisions. One's the division liaison team, which are um, brown cops, which are um, Métis, Native, you know, identified as Indigenous that are coming, and, and they wear a different type of uniform. Um, they've been harassing us and surveilling us, as well as another unit called the Community Industry Response Group. And this group is invented just specifically as the pipeline police. They're there to look after and make sure that the coastal gas link and the Trans Mountain Pipeline infrastructure is secure and safe. And so that's their job. Um, we've had 
um, letters from Amnesty International and the Union of BC Indian Chiefs that wrote letters to um, Jennifer Strachan with the E Division of the RCMP. Jennifer Strachan wrote back um, claiming that Simk First Nation, a federal Indian band, um, is the territorial authority and jurisdiction over the area where Tiny House Warriors is occupying, which is false and incorrect. Simk is a, is a federal Indian band under the Indian Act of Canada. And we are the grassroots people exercising our jurisdiction and authority and title to our collective Sopatmuk territory. Um, so I'm saying this because we need pressure put on the RCMP to stand down. We need that pressure. Um, Jennifer Strachan from the E Division, you know, the Attorney General of Canada, we need people to put pressure on these higher ups to lay off, to back off, hands off tiny house lawyers because we know what happened in the last, um, some of the last standoffs in Sukhumuk Uluk, and that was in 1995 at Gustafson Lake. And we saw how the government, both the provincial and federal government, as, as, as well as the RCMP, um, reacted to Sukhumuk land defenders. They came in with thousands of rounds, APCs, landmines, and criminalized, you know, our Sukhumuk land defenders. So we don't want to see the same thing played out. And, you know, being here at Nascaunleth right now, really reflecting on my elder Wolverine and the last, you know, months that I spent at his bedside and him saying to me clearly on his deathbed, I don't know how I'm going to help you girls, he said, meaning us women warriors, um, fighting this pipeline, he said, because I'm going to be God. <laughs> I never cry on, on video and po podcast, but because I'm going to be gone, but he said, I'm going to call for a federal inquiry into the Gustafson Lake standoff. That's what he said. So he could expose what Canada does to land defenders here in this country. They want to kill them. They want to erase them, and that genocide will continue to happen. And so he called for that federal inquiry, and he wrote a letter to Justin Trudeau and to, and to Jody Wilson-Raybould, who was the Attorney General at the time and he never received a response back. So the year after, well, the year Wolverine passed away, his wife, Ka'a Flo, Flora Sampson, who's also a Chapatin defender, wrote a letter to Justin Trudeau about it, and he never got a response as well. Um, I'm saying this because we need to address how the government of Canada is using the RCMP to deal with our unceded land issue here. Wolverine called it. He called a federal inquiry into the Gustafson Lake stand-up. I want to see that happen. I want to see people who can push that. And if, 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 if it's not a federal national inquiry, how do we get our superpowers, our own Indigenous superpowers in the world to be able to pull off our own, our own um, inquiry into Gustafson Lake to expose Canada and an international setting what they do to Indigenous peoples? So please continue to support us. It's important because Canada is using the RCMP right now to take us down and continue with their genocide. I think that's really important, Kanahus, because of um, all of the calls now to defund and dismantle the RCMP for precisely these reasons, that they always meet us with conflict, with violence, with suppression, um, and, it, and it risks our lives, and it's on a regular basis. You have to live it every day. Um, Chief Judy, is there anything else that you think um, to add about ways that we can support you? Yeah, I just want to be really clear though, right now though, uh, our Sequentum people have the inherent right to uh, occupy and use our lands throughout the Sequentum nation. So uh, when we're occupying to, you know, be able to protect our land, that's an important, it's under our laws and our jurisdiction. It's not based under Indian reservation federal laws. It's not based on provincial laws because the, neither the province or the feds can show they have the underlying title to our territories. It's assumed crowned uh, jurisdiction. And I, I want to say that because I had an email uh, to me the other day from Trans Mountain saying that if I wanted to have a ceremony, if I wanted to make a cultural offering, offering along that route of the pipeline before they start construction, I can go do that. <laughs> and I'm going like, that, that's bizarre. They're saying I, I need to go to them to get permission to, to go on there. So anyway, we're, uh, you know, I spoke to a few of the elders and a few of the people, and they're, they're going to have a ceremony, their own ceremony on Saturday, uh, July 25th, uh, 
starting at sunrise to prepare the fire and probably from eight o'clock to two o'clock. So they're calling all the land defenders, all of the water keepers and all the knowledge keepers and all those who are, are uh, protecting uh, of the sacred, uh, so they're coming out, and and I, it's rightly so because those are the proper titles. Those are the people that you know are from from the land. Uh, they're going to be coming out, so I'm going to be attending with a delegation. Hopefully, representatives from the you know different NGOs and the Amnesty International, just to ensure that the police are going to be uh, behaving themselves and ensure that there is peace there, because that's what this ceremony is is about peace. It's about prayers. It's about discussions of our land. And so I think that's going to be really important. And then Alice was talking about a people's gathering of our Sklopin people so that they can come in together to discuss what the issues are with the, the, the different levels of government, with the province and the feds, and also with the Trans Mountain that's, that's igniting all of this. And also uh, I've been in, uh, you know, a broader coalition will come to, together at a later date, uh, you know, because we're not the only nation that's facing this Trans Mountain issue. There's na uh, nations right from Vancouver Island to the mainland all the way up uh, that, that are having issues with this uh, pipeline. And the NGOs have been certainly very, uh, you know, the non-government groups, environmentalists have been very supportive and, uh, you know, because they're dealing with the broader issues as well and the mm -hmm. same issues we have at Trans Mountain. And we'll continue our fight internationally as well because mm -hmm. they are violating our human rights when they say uh, we can't gather, we can't protect our land, we can't use and occupy our land. And that, that's a broader issue. And I, I don't appreciate Horgan trying to do what uh, Trudeau did uh, to also say, oh, to deal with the town rights issue and the land defenders, uh, we'll, reform the, the, uh, we'll reform the police act. Uh, well, hello, that's what's causing a lot of this, uh, this uh, policing violence and, and racism. So um, I think those issues are public issues as well that, that have to come to the forefront. As, uh, Canada's mentioned, and I appreciate all the work, all the people. There's many, many people. It's not just the, the us individually that are doing this work. Uh, there's many, many people, the ones that take care of our prayers in the mountains. There are spiritual people that continually do that. We have hereditary chiefs that are continuing to do the work that they do. Mm -hmm. Our elders, especially uh, from all walks of the nation, are continually supporting that. I, I don't appreciate when, uh, you know, other leadership try to say and assume that, you know, uh, you know, the, this elder is a dad or that elder. I, I do it broadly because mm -hmm. our elders are important to us and I don't like to assume things from them. But they're coming together because what the elders are saying, what uh, Alice outlined at the very beginning, our elders believe in those Sakleton values and those principles and those teachings. And I had one person tell me one time, if we all agreed on those values and principles, why are we confused? Mm -hmm. And I went to one elder and I said, that's true. How come it's, there's confusion at the council table? How come there's confusion at some of these meetings? And he, I explained to him what that elder said. And he said, well, there shouldn't be any confusion. If you're aligning with your sequestered values and principles, the confusion comes in when somebody tries to offer you money or co uh, convolutes it with money. Then you become confused because oh, yeah. you have to set aside your values and your principles to allow that pipeline to come in. And it was clear when he said that. So stay to your values and your principles because that's what's going to keep us safe. That's what's going to keep us as a nation. That's what's going to uh, ensure our survival as a people. And we have to educate our younger people on that. We have to share that because we don't want them to buying into social media and the colonial concepts that are out there because that's what we're doing. As a, We can only form our own government on our own values and principles not a confused colonial basis of one or a conglomerate uh, multi-corporation corporation agenda. We can't form our government on that. It has to be our values and principles, what our ancestors talked about and what our elders have taught us. We have to continue and it aligns with the teachings with, from the creator. Of the being. So thank you, thank you for that. There's multiple levels we're working on, but uh, there's a mass amount of us. It's not just us, there's many, many levels that are working on this, uh, North American, um, international, uh, all across Turtle Island and all across all walks of life. A reporter asked me once, oh, this is an indigenous issue, uh, this pipeline. I said, no, it's not. I said, there's the Victoria City, the island that doesn't want tankers in the, in mm -hmm. the ocean. Lower mainland, Burnaby, Vancouver, they don't want tankers. They don't support the pipeline in the, you know, Trans Mountain. So it's like three, four million people and, and they're just trying to say it's just a handful of us indigenous people. That's just a misconception they're trying to, to make to make themselves justified in pushing through this pipeline. 
So we're still standing up. We're going to be there. We're going to be in ceremony Saturday, and we're going to continue the work we need to do. And, and I uh, hold up my hands to all the people that are working on this because they're doing it without resources. They're doing it without support. And as Canada has mentioned, they're actually being attacked by people and threatened by people and physically assaulted in doing this work on the ground. Those are human rights violations internationally, and those can't happen to them. We have to keep it peaceful. We have to keep it, you know, aligned to those values and principles. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. All three of you have, um, you know, left us with all different ways that we can support you in what you're doing. And I understand there could possibly be live streaming for some of the discussions and the uh, press on Saturday. And if that's the case, I'll make sure to also post those links so that people can tune in. Um, but before we end, um, I'd like to give your elder Alice an opportunity if you have any last words before we close out. You're talking about the uh, police violence and um, the military on, on our Indigenous people, the protectors of our territories and, and waters. I wanted to mention um, Horgan, who is, who is proposedly doing an RCMP overview and a review. And he's, to my understanding, he's uh, contracted Mary Ellen Terpel Lafond to uh, undertake this task. And I guess what I would mention is there is no place other than to get uh, to get good information is to be right there on site and to watch that interaction and to watch a police brutality and violence. So I would invite Mary Ellen Terpel Lafond to come out on Saturday and to watch. And maybe that would tame the RCMP down and um, to, to uh, go on the front lines with our people as she's undertaken such an important and huge task when it comes down to our, our grand, because our grandmothers are on the front lines as well. Our children are on the front lines. Our women are on the front lines. It's not just police brutality in the jail cells or in their offices. There's uh, police brutality out there on our front lines protecting our indigenous lands and our waters. So I would, I would say, and I would encourage her, go out there, Mary Ellen Turpel, out on the front lines. And this, because this is a very important contract, a task that you have, you know, and, and it is for British Columbia. So as a, as a Gal uh, uh overseeing all of what is happening, uh, give her the strength to please go out there and the courage to go out there and to actually watch firsthand of how the RCMP treat our Indigenous people. Okay, so thank you for that. And, and I'd like to say a prayer, if that is okay yes, with you, please. Pat. Yes. Okay. The Gelta Gugby, Anna Weeks, is lots of humes, as white questions. A lots of consultants of white is a timid to cock name and demi alias of cock machines, and knock on them a white is the Golmuch, as a swap of Uluk, my Yucha means is, my daughters make east is my daughters, my conquendus to Gelta Gugby. Thank you. Well, thanks to all of you for taking the time. I know you're preparing for what's happening on Saturday and um, you're you know, always on the ground, always working for your nation. So, I mean, this is a, a powerful group of women. You share your knowledge and your wisdom and your love and compassion and tears for the struggles that we face, but also with a positive message that we're still out there and we're still defending our territories. And that offers so much hope. And in each thing that you do, every time you erect a tiny house, every time you speak out, these are all little victories for us. When all of the insurance companies start taking away the insurance for Trans Mountain Pipeline because of the work that you're doing, th these are victories and we need to celebrate these victories because we're winning. We're in this for the long haul and we're going to win at the end. So thank you for the work that you do, your power and your inspiration for us and everybody that's listening. And you know, thank you to all the podcast listeners for not just listening, but for committing to take action after this with whatever way you can, whether you're a researcher or you have money or you're in the media, whichever is your skill set, 
take that and use that to support the Shequemic Nation and the people trying to protect their territories. And I will post links to all of the resources that we've mentioned. And most importantly, share this podcast. It's also going to be a YouTube video. Share it widely. Get it out there. Um, because that's really important. It's important that we keep the pressure on and that we all bear witness to what happens, the good and the challenges, because by bearing witness, you keep us safe and you prevent um, bad things from happening. So you can access this podcast on all the different apps on my website, www.pampalmeter.com. And we'll make sure to keep this updated and any links from Saturday as well. Thank you so much to all of you. You've honored me. Thank you to all the listeners. Until next time, keep living a warrior life. Walalia. Ciao.